you're watching Meet the Candidates on Brockton Community Access and it's BCA's educational mission to educate the voters to let them know about the candidates that are running for the most important office here in the City of Champions, the Mayor's Office. With me is Mark Lawton. Mark, nice to see you. Mark, it's a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. We're at the end of the preliminary election, the weekend before, right. September 17th, and Mark Edward Lawton is a candidate for office again. I remember back when I was a youngster, I was 14 years old, the first time you ran for I was a state a representative. Too. Okay. Why Mark Lawton? Why now? Uh, well, the Enterprise asked me that several weeks ago, five weeks ago. They asked me, uh, why are you running? And I, I said, I'll give it to you in five words. My best friend died. Mm -hmm. um, Billy, as you know, Billy Carpenter uh, founded Independence Academy and he knew I was behind the founding of the Boys and Girls Club many years ago. So when I left the bench early, I decided to leave the bench. I was the youngest member ever appointed to the trial court, Massachusetts trial court, after all those years doing murder cases and taking children away from drug addicted mothers. I got burnt out, I decided it was time to leave. Left very early, uh, I didn't have to leave when I did. Went into private practice with my brothers uh, got on the Independence Academy board, chaired by Billy Carpenter before he ran for mayor. Uh, became very good friends with Bill. Uh, admired him greatly for his vision, for his empathy, uh, for everything. I just, Billy was a special, special guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, a few months into my sitting on the board with Billy, he came to the office one day on Belmont Street uh, our office is at 157 Belmont, ne next to Russell Peak Funeral Home. In between that, Russell Peak Funeral Home and the Bill Unknown School, where Billy died on Jan uh, July 3rd. And Billy told me in January of 13 that he wanted to run for mayor. And I said, all right, good for you. And he said, well, what do you think? We talked about it for about an hour and a half. And at the end of the hour and a half, I said to Bill, if you are committed to changing the face of the city, changing everything in it, the culture, the face of the city, start hiring people that reflect the people uh, that live here, decide if you promise me that, I'll help you in your campaign. And I did. So I wound up without any request that I run as the campaign. I wound up running his campaign at 13. As you know, he won in a Bill Carpenter landslide with a 55 vote plurality. And then I ran his campaign again in 2015, and then 2017, and uh, in 2019 until his death on the 3rd of July. Uh, so that's how I got involved with Billy. And on the day of his funeral, now I had never, after my five terms in the House of Representatives, I never thought about running for office ever again. Never had a thought. Never occurred. I was really happy uh, practicing law, uh, helping Patty raise money to feed the hungry in Brockton. She's president of the Brockton Charity Guild, uh, running Billy's campaigns. I mean, I was busy. Sure. Um, I never thought about running for anything. And then on the day of Billy's funeral, uh, and after trying to find someone who could succeed Billy and finish what Billy started, it was that afternoon at 3.10 in the afternoon that uh, Patty said, Mark, why don't you just run? And it was that spontaneous. Um, it was, you talk about spontaneity, that was it. There wasn't a lot of thought that went into it, but I just knew intuitively it was the right thing to do, even though I hadn't run for office for a while to finish what Billy started. And if I may, as an extension of my comment, yep. if I may. Yes. Uh, so I've been asked, what do you mean finish what Billy started? Well, there's a lot of things. One is to, con to continue an economic expansion that has been the greatest in the last four years, the greatest economic expansion in Brockton's history. Um, and we know that jobs, uh, follow economic expansion. 
property values increase as part of that economic expansion, and greater, the greater investment of private and public, uh, public equity capital follows. But that all happened because Billy um, decided with Bobby Hayden, his first uh, police chief, and myself and others, that none of that would be possible unless you uh, first assault crime and defeat crime as best you can. Now, you're going to have crime, by the way, in Sudbury, Mass., Concord, Mass., Duxbury, Mass., because crime is everywhere, right? Um, but Brockton, there was this perception, and by the way, it was based on strong uh, statistical and empirical data that we had our, uh, our lion's share of crime, violent crime, nonviolent crime. Uh, and so statistically, it was there. It was also, that was the predicate, if you will, for the perception that the public had that, you know what, Brockton has too much crime. So with Bob Hayden, Bob Hayden and the mayor put together this magical uh, solution, mo a crime mo uh, fighting model that involved cobbling together the cooperation of local, county, state, and most importantly, federal agencies like Homeland Security and ICE. Now you say to yourself, well, that doesn't sound like a very magical formula, so why hadn't anybody else do it? I can't answer that, but it worked. Mm -hmm. And since the time Billy was sworn in, in January of 2014, violent crime has come down almost 13%. Uh, Gun-related incidents of violence have come down a remarkable 34%. So if you look at the statistics, the FBI statistics, rather than crime, violent, nonviolent, going up every year, every year, mm -hmm. for what, 18 to 19 years? It's come down four straight years. It's pretty good. Well, I remember pretty good. during the campaign listening to Bill Carpenter at the Italian Kitchen with the Campello Business Association talking about exactly what you're talking about. Yep. And you were on the other end of the criminal activity with the juveniles. Yeah, okay. I was, well, I did, I sat uh, in Boston and in Brockton. Mm -hmm. I did adult cases and I did juvenile cases. Uh, I did more murder cases than anybody in the system in the years that I was running a jury session in Boston. But again, I sat in Brockton and here. But if I may, just give me permission just to finish my thought. Yep. Um, crime started coming down. And when it did, it was quite obvious that it was done as a result of this magical crime-fighting formula that really nobody had ever used before. We just didn't talk about it. We did it. And it was all put together by Bob Hayden. Um, and that's why, in my experience as a judge, as a private attorney, as a citizen, as a campaign manager for Billy. It's why I have become known for stopping Sanctuary City. Because I know, if you look at the Institute of Immigration Studies, and uh, if you look at FBI statistics, and just regular data that the public has access to, Sanctuary Cities, have a higher rate of crime, and that is violent crime as well as property crime, has a higher rate of crime than non-sanctuary cities using the same size, population, and demographic makeup. It's a fact. Today is Friday. That's a fact. So I have always been against the adoption of a sanctuary city piece of legislation, which and I know I'm begging you for time here, if I may. Can I ask you a question Go as ahead. part of that time? Absolutely. Do you think your record, talking about sanctuary cities, and what you're saying has been distorted by your opponents? I have no idea. That's, that's for you to decide. Okay. All I want to do is this, Mike. I'm at an age now, and when I, I'm in a period in my life, um, my political life, my social life, my personal chronological life, I don't know how else to put it, where I only worry about one thing, and I worry about making things better, and I did with Billy, 
And whether it's in my own life, whether it's working with the Boys and Girls Club, getting that started, raising money to feed the poor. Um, you know what, Mac? I'm at a period now where I just want to let people know how I feel. If people don't want to vote for me because they want a sanctuary city, if they don't want to vote for me, that's fine. That's fine. I would hope that people would feel like me that we shouldn't adopt a sanctuary city. And again, I'm going to go back to my request of 30, 31 seconds ago, okay. if I may. Yep. Uh, the Trust Act that has been around not for one year, not for two years, for four years. Mm -hmm. For this entire legislative session and the previous legislative session as well. 16, 17, 18, and 19. Four years. And the city council has toyed with this thing unremittingly. Mm -hmm. And they keep on having another hearing, one hearing after another. Let me just say this. If something's a bad piece of legislation, you kill it. In the House of Representatives or in the U.S. Congress, if you have a bad piece of legislation, it comes out of committee adversely, and the adverse committee report is accepted on the floor of the Congress or the Massachusetts House of Representatives. You kill it. You don't keep it alive for four years and instill fear in the hearts of people that live here who think that it may get adopted. You kill it. And any piece of legislation, proposed legislation, I don't care what you call it. You can call it the Trust Act, the Promise Act, the Beauty Act, Shakespearean Sonnet. I don't care what you call it. It's still sanctuary city. Any piece of legislation that says, as it does in page two of the uh, Trust Act, that the Brockton Police Department shall not, mandatory language, not optional language, the Brockton Police Department shall not cooperate with any federal agency, Homeland Security or ICE, in terms of sharing any information about anybody who may reside in this city, the city of Brockton, dealing with immigration status, or whether or not they're even incarcerated and being held on bail, shall not share it. Well, that means that the person like Flavio Andrade, who broke out of a Brazilian prison, he was thrice convicted, three times convicted of rape. Mm -hmm. He escaped from a Brazilian prison. Did he go to Miami, Florida? No. Did he go to Cleveland, Ohio? No. Did he go to Oakland, California? No. Did he go to Nashua, New Hampshire? No. He went to Brockton because he thought it was a sanctuary city. And on April 21st of this year, the Brockton Police Department, with the cooperation of the Homeland Security and ICE, found him, arrested him, and put him back into custody. Mm -hmm. And he's in the middle now of deportation hearings to be sent back to, uh, to Brazil. So I don't care if you're from... Dublin, Ireland, Prague, Stockholm, Brazil. I don't really care where you're from. If you're raping people and you're breaking out of prisons and you're in our city, the Brockton Police Department not only has a right, they have an obligation to the people that live here to get those people and get them out of here. If you don't, crime will continue. Get them out of my city. Now, it was just, I believe, nine days ago that the acting mayor in this city said when there was some shots fired down on Grafton Street. He was quoted as saying, get those people out of here. Pretty good. I favor that. Mm -hmm. Get them out of here. And that's all I've said. And whether it was uh, a DTO, a drug trafficking organization, uh, run by foreign nationals who are running heroin, and f laced with fentanyl, which is 50 times stronger than heroin, more po powerful, bringing it into our city, destroying our neighborhoods, and I don't have enough hairs on my head, and granted I'm losing some hair, as are you, by the way, mm -hmm. to name all the young kids, and I don't mean that as an insult. I you know, always, you I always know. look good. But I don't have enough hairs on my head to name all the young kids, whether it was Matty Pariso or Peter Marciano or Evan Green or Kevin Dean, you name it, T.J. Valla, young kids who I've known, I've known personally who have died as a result of overdoses. I don't want young kids to die any more than I want a neighborhood to die, any more than I want a city to die. Sanctuary city is bad. Crime is bad. And that's something that you don't compromise on now or ever. So if I'm fortunate enough to get elected, and I hope I do, if I don't, I wish the people of Brockton well. And I hope that they'll choose someone who they believe can lead them 
to a crime-free, not that that's possible anyway, but it should always be our goal, to a crime-free city, a city that will allow the elderly mm -hmm. to live here in peace, a city that will allow mothers and fathers to live here and allow their kids to go out and play in playgrounds like I did, whether it be O'Donnell's down the east side or James Edgar in Ward 2. That's all we did, and you know that, or the Ash Street Playground. Yeah. Yeah. You lived on Ash Street. Yeah. You played more baseball games there than anyone. Yeah. Because you did. And that's a good thing. And that's what really makes a city great. To allow your kids at heavy cheese sandwich and peanut butter marshmallow sandwich with some slices of banana. You're going to eat it now, and you kids can leave, but I want you back here by five. See you later. You want that. That's what makes us great. I gotta shift gears because we did 15 minutes on this one issue, oh, right. just so you know, yep. okay? Um, we talked about crime, we talked about sanctuary cities, we talked a little bit about economic development. Yep. Let's talk about quality of life in Brockton. Okay. A mayor has a lot of responsibility being chair of the school committee. We can talk about education if we have any time. Yep. But um, there's other competing interests. Um, public safety, obviously, number one in terms of funding, but things yeah. like libraries and DW Field Park and cleanliness. Right. You grew up here, you lived here, you experienced good times in, in the city of Brockton. How do you decide your priorities as mayor and get the city council on the same page while you're juggling budget and economic development issues? Yeah. I'm not so sure there's a formulaic answer to that. In other words, there's no formula mm -hmm. to answer your question, right? So that's why you always ask a candidate, uh, whoever it may be, who may be sitting across the table from you, what are your priorities, right? right? And I think for the last, what, 15 minutes, mm -hmm. we talked We talked more than that, I don't know. 15. Sometimes I just talk, my kids say, Dad, you could talk to an oak tree. I said, yeah, I could, I guess. But uh, your first priority has got to be crime because everything flows from that. And we know that since World War II, people move into a community and move out of, community, out of a community because of crime and the quality of public school education. Now, you just mentioned education. So if you can turn the quarter, uh, corner on crime, then you can turn your attention to the quality of public school education. Now, I don't think you remember because you, you get a, you're a couple of years behind me, but growing up on the east side, we had a little red schoolhouse. Mm -hmm. And it was, t when you talk about a little red schoolhouse, it was a little red schoolhouse. There were four rooms in it. And it was called the Sylvester School. I believe it was built in 1872 or three. It was torn down in 1967. That's where I went to school when we lived on Carey Street on the east side. And... Um, it was different then, obviously. But if you grow up in a, in a, a gateway city like uh, Brockton, even though when you're growing up you don't realize it's a gateway city, but that, for your listeners, a gateway city is one of the seven industrial hubs in, uh, in the 19th and 20th centuries, right? But public school education is the other reason, other than crime, why people move in and move out of, commu out of a community. The good news is, is that even though we've been shot into money by the Commonwealth under Chapter 70, Brockton has always maintained an awesome reputation mm -hmm. for its public schools. It's always maintained that. And you have to give great credit to not just uh, people like uh, Kathy Smith and Maddie George and others, but also to the teachers right. who teach in our system, whether it be K through seven, or Brockton High in the 10th, 11th, and 12th grades. They're the ones that make a great system. Uh, and uh, as importantly, the families from which these kids come, right? The good news is that as we speak, the House and Senate are considering what's called the Promise Act. And Senator Chang Diaz from Jamaica Plain, uh, as well as Governor Baker, they have competing proposals to correct the intentional underfunding of the Educational Investment Act that is now 26 years old, 28 years old, um, and start to 
give to the gateway cities amount of money, uh, amounts of money so that we can approach what they're spending in the Concords and elsewhere. Now, we don't have the strong tax base because you can't keep on saying to our narrow tax base, middle class taxpayers who are retired and, and can just barely buy enough food to get to the end of the week, you're going to be paying an additional $900 a year in property taxes. You can't keep on doing that. Right. It's not fair. It's not right. It's not equitable. So uh, the Promise Act promises to the city of Brockton between 24 and $70 million additional a year in funding to correct a almost 30-year inequity so we can start paying uh, per student what they spend what they spend on a student elsewhere. And it's going to turn our public, the quality of our public education around, and it's going to do it dramatically. This year alone, I know you want to get off this subject maybe, but this year alone, the House and Senate uh, put on the governor's desk, and the governor signed it into law, $296 million additional dollars just for gateway cities. So mm -hmm. we get a pretty good chunk of that. What they haven't done yet, and hopefully they'll do it sometime this fall, and the House and Senate... The, uh, the Joint Committee on Education, they're working on a formula through which it's like a sieve, through which those new monies, almost $300, will flow and how they get dispersed to Brockton, Fall River, New Bedford, Holyoke, Boston, and the other gateway, Lawrence and Lowell, the gateway cities. So they're working on that formula now. Brockton makes out, will make out splendidly, and hopefully uh, between now and uh, 2026, we'll continue to make out splendidly. So if we can hit out of the park crime by getting control of the drug trade, mm -hmm. keeping Sanctuary City out of here, and get proper funding that we're entitled to, so each student who attends school here gets as much money as a student would be in Sudbury, in Wayland, and elsewhere in Concord, then you know what? We've turned it around. Then you can turn your attention to other priorities. And you just mentioned cleaning up the city, quality of life. And if I have two minutes just to address this, mm -hmm. and I know we only have so much. I'm trying to squeeze 20 pounds into a 10-pound bag. But you know going around the city, it's getting better. You go into a neighborhood and down the street and you see rubbish. You see bathtubs. You see old milk bottles that are crushed. You see Dairy Queen uh, cups and stuff that's thrown out of uh, cars. Granted, we haven't kept up, although we're doing a better job, cleaning up litter. But there's an old theory from 1982 by George, uh, I believe his name is Kering, K-E-R-R-I-N-G. You can go Google it. Going back to 1982, a criminologist from Boston who came up with a theory, and it's uh, proven to be true. It's called the broken windows theory. Right. The broken windows theory. And it stands for this proposition, Mike, and it's interesting, and it's true, and it works, that in any neighborhood where you see rubbish and debris and broken glass mm -hmm. from a broken window, that invites the public to believe that in that neighborhood there's chaos and disorder, and it invites crime. And crime follows a broken window. It's called the broken window theory. And so the more we can clean up the city to improve quality of life, you get a double whammy. You get the benefit of reduction in crime, which we're already fighting anyway. So the quality of life comes and you can drive down a street, whether it's Campello, Montello, East Side, West Side, Ward 1, uh, Ward 5, doesn't make any difference. And rather than see rubbish everywhere, one of my things that I'll do if I ever get elected, I want to spend some time myself in the neighborhoods picking up rubbish. Mm -hmm. Picking it up, if I can, it's a pretty good role model, isn't it? Todd Petty always used to do that. Absolutely, and I do it now up on Belmont Street. Right, right. Near I do it now. I walk up and down Belmont Street picking up Dairy Queen cups. I bring out a little green uh, trash bag and I pick it up. And I know Todd Petty. I used to see Todd Petty do it. And I haven't seen, seen uh, uh, Todd do it lately because now your replacement rubbish man is me. There Mark you go. Lawton. There you I go. go up and down uh, Belmont Street. But the broken glass theory of addressing quality of life and crime is empirically correct, and it works. It does work. In, in terms of quality of life, Mark, it doesn't get any better. 
Other people see the man picking up rubbish. Say, that's a pretty, that's pretty cool. Absolutely. Yeah. So let me ask you, before I give you the final closing thought, so you can talk directly yeah. to the voters. Um, you talked about, in terms of education and um, crime, yep. if people leave, that drives them out. You addressed it at the mayoral debate with the NAACP. Yep. Just for the record, reiterate why you left and why, why, I left. why you left and why you're coming back. And people know when I was setting bail, I was sitting in Brockton as a judge in Boston, when I was holding, holding people on bail, everybody knows this, um, I would see people at the Y and at the Westgate Mall. I would always see people I'd hold on bail. I used to be with my, little, my three little kids. They were babies at the time. Right. And it was uncomfortable. So Patty and I moved to Bridgewater, still worked in Brockton every day, Mm -hmm. Founded the Boys and Girls Club, ran Billy's campaigns, stayed involved, raising money to feed the poor. I never left. I've been here every day. And when we were raising money to feed the poor, nobody said, Mark, where did you sleep last night? When we were busy creating the Boys and Girls Club that helps hundreds of kids, white, black, old, and young, nobody ever said, Mark, where did you sleep last night? We put our house up for sale as soon as Billy got elected in 2014, 2015. We put our house up for sale, and it's wicked easy to do. Check MLS. Right. It's one of the easiest things you can do, right? That 2014 and 15, we put it up for sale. And everybody knows that in 2016, I came down with cancer, same cancer that my father died from. And I'm cancer-free, by the way, okay. uh, fortunately. But I went through a year and a half of fighting that with surgery at the Beth Israel, chemotherapy, the Lupron, du uh, Lupron Depot shots. I did that. I'm cancer-free. Billy's death accelerated things for us so that we put a house up for sale. Check MLS. And you know Check what? You MLS. can get more, way and more I'm for here. the money for the market here. Yeah, and I'm, uh, I've been in Brockton every day. Every day, not six days a week. I've been in Brockton at the law office. I do free legal work for the most part, much to the chagrin of my family. And most of it's immigration work. I help people stay in this country. Uh, people who have TPS status and people who have a misdemeanor and they're being deported because it's looked at as a crime involving moral turpitude. I do basically free legal work. Nobody's ever asked me, where you slept last night when I'm trying to feed the poor or doing free legal work. Um, Wrap that into your closing statement because okay. I, I got a minute and it's yours. Good. So talk to the voters directly. Right now? Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mark Lawton, born and bred in Brockton, born at 10 Turner Street, third floor, grew up on the east side. Uh, long-term Brocktonian, served Brockton on the House of Representatives for 10 years, uh, served on the Massachusetts trial court for over 20. The oldest of five sons of Jim and Jean Lawton married Patty O'Leary from the West Side. My East Side friends used to give me a hard time because I dated and married a West Side girl. Um, and we have three children. They went to school here. They played Little League here. Uh, I am against Sanctuary City. I stand for the proposition that we shall assault crime and we shall defeat crime, encouraging the private investment that not only is necessary for economic growth, but it is necessary also for the sustainable revenue that we need to fund all public services, whether it's police, fire, or public education. So my name is Mark Lawton. I would ask that you uh, consider me on Tuesday, September 17th, uh, which is the municipal primary, and again, I'm running for mayor. I appreciate the great honor extended to me to go before you on Tuesday the 17th. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. Don't mean Mark. to cut you off, but we're out of time. Yep. Make sure on Tuesday the 17th that you go out and exercise your right to vote that people fought and died for and show us how the City of Champions will turn out. Thanks for joining us.